everyone, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all of the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us for his last show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best day movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And it is a weird day, man. It is uh, it is my final movie talk. It is my birthday. And of course, Pimpin' Ain't Easy, my new <laughs> book, The Pride, on Amazon right now. Head on over there and get that. So uh, yeah, it's a fabulous day to be here. Also joining in the weirdness, Christian Harlock. Happy birthday, sir. Thank you. Uh, I will join the crew by being the only one without a computer. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and Dennis Zen. Yeah, happy birthday to John. Uh, yeah, we're sad that it's your last day here at Movie Talk. We're going to miss you. I, I just got your book as well, so I'll be starting to read that this weekend. And also, your wife has stopped by here with a pretty awesome birthday cake. Yes, my what? wife is. Is she here? I don't see her. Oh, there she is. Yay. My wife is here for our last show. Woo. Come on this birthday. side. Watch your step. Oh, my God. That's that cake amazing. is awesome. Wanted Take to a wish look you at. A happy birthday. I don't know. Is there any way you can get a, a close up, <laughs> a close not close up, but a single shot of this BBA cake? This is. Look at this thing. That is so that is cute. Awesome. Thank you. Baby. Aww. Aww. Um, goals. This is a great day. Goals. My wife comes <laughs> in. I get a BB-8 birthday cake. This is pretty sweet. Christian Harloff <laughs> eat your cake in front of you. And whole thing. We're just gonna all eat the cake and not do a. Show That's today. pretty much it. Maybe we should crack out some forks. <laughs> right. Or is this all? What, what's that stuff they call in the cakes that is just like uh, fondant? Fondant. <laughs> I keep fondant. fondant. Why was I gonna call it uh, something totally different? Uh, all yeah, right. Christian's face lit up. <laughs> I don't think they call it that. <laughs> Maybe in England. Oh, where's Ashley Mova when you need her? <laughs> Maybe in England. <laughs> All right, we got a show to do. Let's do this. Back a, back a few years, Disney set David Fincher to direct a new iteration of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea that would feature an entirely different take on the source material. Due to a difference in opinion with casting, Fincher left the project, leaving the director's chair open for another name. Now Deadline is reporting that the Wolverine director, James Mangold, has been brought on to helm the picture. Entitled Captain Nemo, the project is described as an origin story for the character as he creates and builds his Nautilus. No word yet on any cast or release date. John, what do you think of James Mangold directing Captain Nemo? Well, I mean, it was, I was always very pumped and excited uh, an age ago about fin Finker's um, uh, take on the whole thing. But Mangold is a name I really like. Look, the, his Wolverine movie did not turn out the way we all wanted, but I like the sensibility he brought to it. I like what he was going for and kind of what he was trying to do. And I think him taking another crack at it, I think he'll probably get there. Um, plus, you know, he's got an Academy Award pedigree background and stuff like that. I'm very curious. Now, it'll all come down to how do they approach 20,000 Leagues? How do they approach Captain Nemo? Look, they had Captain Nemo in that little League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. <laughs> And they botched that. I did a little bit of work on that film, too. <laughs> um, every single movie I ever worked on when I was in the visual effects industry turned out terrible. But anyway, um, so I like the news. I have I have hope for it. We still got to wait to see what kind of take they're going to put on this thing. But otherwise, I, I think it's pretty good. What do you think, Dennis? Yeah, I, I like Wolverine much more than I think most people did. Obviously, the ending yeah, was, the it was kind of disappointing. I watched yeah. the unrated version that had the cool actual, like, uh, 10 minutes of fighting of kind of uh, ninjas and all that stuff that was kind of missing from the movie. And, and his other movies, yeah, not only uh, Walk the Line, he got, I think, a, didn't he get an Oscar nomination for that? Yes. Or at least the movie was nominated for it. The movie Oscar. was, yes. Yeah. He, he also did one of my favorite westerns, the 310 to Yuma re remake with Russell Crowe and uh I and love Christian that Bale. movie, yeah. Um, so definitely I'm excited about him doing it. I think it's supposed to be like an origin story for Captain Nemo. So I... Hopefully this will be different than Brian Singer's Twenty Thousand League Under the Under the Sea. Yeah, version. lest we forget, he's also working on a Twenty yeah, Thousand Leagues. Yeah, so thing. maybe that will keep things different. I don't want to see two movies just like the same. But yeah, I, I, I I'm excited for this. Um, I don't know if I'm excited for it because I was really excited for Fincher. Yeah, I was really excited to see what he would bring to Nemo's story. Um, and I like Mango I do a lot for all the reasons that you just said. Those movies for sure. And and I like I also liked Wolverine. Didn't like the ending. But it's just you know it, I don't think he's an equal to Fincher. So that's why it was harder for me. I still am gonna go into it. Okay, that's a, that is a very good director that they're they're having handled this property. 
But there's just something about me that's going to be missing the p potential of a David Fincher sure. Nemo story. Yeah. Well, they're saying that Fincher left because he wanted Channing Tatum in that lead role, and Disney wanted Chris Hemsworth. So hmm. it'd be interesting who they're going to cast with Mangold as director. If he brought, I don't someone, like either one of those choices. I, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I like both those guys yeah. very much. But, not but that. I, I, I we don't just see saw that. him do that Ron Howard movie, and that wasn't great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What about Russell Crowe or Christian Bale that he's worked with before in 310 to Yuma? I think either one of them could play a pretty good Captain Nemo. It all depends, though, on, look, if this is an origin story, mm -hmm. like, are, are we, is it a 26-year-old Captain Nemo? And if so, then no matter how much I love Russell Crowe, he's the wrong guy for it. Uh, same thing with Christian Bale. So it all depends on what the treatment is. I mean, because, you know, a lot of people wanted uh, Brian Cranston for Lex Luthor, but that's before we, any of us knew that the Lex Luthor they were going for was a young upstart tech mogul. Mm. So obviously Brian Cranston doesn't work. I would be, look, if they announced tomorrow Russell Crowe or Christian Bale as Captain Nemo in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, that's your throw a freaking party. Yeah. But until we know what kind of character they're going for or what their angle is, it's hard to say whether he'd be the, either one of them would be the right choice or the wrong choice. True. All right, what's next? One of the most popular video games of all time is Minecraft. It's getting the video game to movie adaptation. Thanks to Stephen Frosty Weintraub of Collider.com, who spoke with producer Roy Lee, we now have some details on that adaptation. The movie will target the same audience as Jurassic World and will be about a multiverse where humans can enter the world and feel what it's like to have a live action version of a Minecraft experience. The movie is currently being written by It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia star Rob McElney, who will also direct. No word yet on a release date. Dennis, what do you think of the premise of the new Minecraft movie? Well, I personally haven't gotten into Minecraft. I know it's a huge, huge game. There's a huge following and rabid following as well, but I'm not against a Minecraft movie. What I don't understand is there's kind of this trend where movies like this, where I think would be great as a 3D animated movie, are being turned into live action films. We, we talked about Sonic the Hedgehog a few weeks ago, and it's like, why is that one being turned into live action? I know it's going to be a mix of CG plus live action, but this is another one I just don't get it. The whole point of Minecraft is being in that world and having that distinct look to it. Maybe maybe my mind will change when they have a trailer that comes mm. out and it'll blow my mind and I'll, I'll totally change my mind. But for now, I'm like, I'm still wondering about that. Totally agree with you. I mean, I, ca I can't conceive of what their strategy on this is. What's their vision? Now, if they've got some really cool, amazing idea for their take on this world, that's going to be interesting because Look, no video game movie really up to date has really stuck to what the game is about. So it doesn't matter. Like you got Minecraft, you got the IP recognition there. I get it. You're making a movie around that. I agree with you. The live action spin on it, though, struck me as odd. Now, I can sort of understand it. If you did an entire animated movie in that Minecraft pixelated kind of way, I doubt it would attract a lot of people. So I kind of see it that way. But... I guess I'm just going to hold tight and, and see what is their slant on this that's got us all excited. Yeah, see, I think that for me, I'm, I obviously think that it is a good idea to make it because it's, a, it, like you said, Dennis, it's a property that a lot of people is very popular. Yeah. I don't know enough about it to where I'm going to be passionate about a live action or an animated one. But what I will say is that I'd be very curious because I don't think it's the same thing with Sonic because it's that one particular character that I think because you're going into that Smurfs territory and the Chipmunks territory mm. where that those things don't work is where Minecraft maybe they have a whole new Are you suggesting the Chipmunks didn't work? The sh <laughs> little, <laughs> little, little the filthy shit rats. Shit rats. Um, but I Blasphemy. Th <laughs> um, but, but I think for me like if they design it away that's new and innovative that we don't really know how the, like the, the, there's a vision for it that really pops on screen then maybe that's why they want to go that direction. I don't know why, but for some reason when I read this story, all I could think of is like some sort of 80s Saturday morning cartoon with like a green screen and some dude in front of it running on a treadmill. Right. That, no you know, like that's that, exactly that. what they're thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's exactly, they're shooting it right yeah. now across the hall. <laughs> all right, folks, we reset part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Natasha's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So Natasha, what do we got? The Baywatch movie already has a number of A-list talent attached, including Dwayne Johnson, Zac Efron, and San Andreas's Alexandra Daddario. What most fans don't know, however, is whether or not Pamela Anderson will be included in the movie. In an interview with Entertainment Tonight Canada, Anderson confirmed the filmmakers have reached out to her saying, I haven't turned it down completely yet, but I have turned down what they offered me. But we'll see what happens. I haven't even read the script. I have no idea what it's about 
about. Baywatch was such a huge part of my life and really they're trying to do an homage and you know it's an honor to have them to want me to be a part of it so bad. Christian, buy or sell Pamela Anderson appearing in the new Baywatch movie? Well, if it was our comments, I'd sell those comments pretty quick. But as far as her <laughs> being in the movie, yeah, I'd buy it because her, her representation is going... What are you doing? <laughs> what you're doing nothing right now. You're gonna be in a movie with the Rock and Zach Efron, even if it's like a five or ten minute scene, whatever it is, do the movie. If it because if it's a funny scene and it works, people will be talking about that scene. That you're not it's not Pam Anderson nineteen ninety five. It's Pam Anderson two thousand sixteen. Know as the rock would say, know your role. Know exactly <laughs> what you're gonna do here because she could get back in the public eye if it's a good scene and everything happens. She's not the best actress in the world and the reason why she was she was one of the most attractive women on the planet back then and that show was campy as all hell and they're gonna have her do something Something kind of silly in the movie embrace it do it so do i think yes she'll come to her senses and she'll realize that it's a big huge movie with one of the biggest movie stars on the planet she'll be in the movie my first reaction to this first of all is to her comments my first reaction to her comments is what the hell else do you right. have going on pamela anderson but then i think about it she is still collecting them royalty checks for baywatch being shown in syndication all over the world and she's probably still making a truckload of money just from that so tip of the hat to you um but her thing about you know i turned down what they originally offered come on you are not some artiste even though you're a good canadian girl and all that kind of stuff give me a break if they want you in this movie you're gonna say yes and you're gonna be in the movie and if you don't want to do it i would encourage the filmmakers of this new baywatch movie to not bend over backwards for this lady it would it be cool to have her in there as an homage to the thing, yes. Do you need her? No, you don't. Give her the offer again. If she says no, say thanks and buy Felicia and move on. Felicia. Woo! I'll, I'll, I'll buy that they'll figure out a way. I mean, I'm actually more curious now about what they did propose to her and what she turned down. Like, like was it something that was actually really funny, but she just didn't want to do it for her image's sake? Uh, but, I mean, she's synonymous <laughs> with with. Baywatch, you know, even more so than David Hasselhoff, who I also hope they have a cameo of because he, you know, he had the that'd whole, be a more important cameo in my opinion. True. But I mean, he's also associated with Knight Rider. You know, he's Michael. Yes. Knight. Uh, but for her, everyone thinks uh, Playboy Bunny and, and, and Baywatch. They're just going to film at the beach that he's passed out. on, <laughs> Drunk and passed out. And he's singing, yeah. he's singing, singing yeah. in German. Yeah, um, yeah but I, I think they're eventually going to figure it out. All right. What's next? Disney has released a number of Zootopia parody posters poking fun at this year's crop of Oscar movies, as well as some of the box office blockbusters from last year. Included in the posters, Steve Paws, Bridge of Sloths, The Hibernant, <laughs> Mad Yak's Fury Road, and a parody of Star Wars The Force Awakens. This is all to drum up some interest in the latest animated movie, which stars the voices of Jennifer Goodwin, Jason Bateman, Shakira, Idris Elba, and J.K. Simmons. Zootopia opens in theaters March 4th, 2016. John, buy or sell these Zootopia parody posters. Buy them. Love it. These are cute. They're clever. And in case you didn't catch the little subtitle on the Star Wars one, Star Wars the first, like F-U-R-C-E, <laughs> the first Awakens. Look, I and I think part of the reason why I find them so charming is because I have seen the movie already. And the movie is charming and clever and cute. It's just a happy movie. It's a really fun time at the theaters. So I encourage you to go out and see it uh, when you when you have the chance to see it. Yeah, but I love this type of creative. I wish these posters had come out like maybe two weeks ago. I think they're a little slow to move on this. Mm -hmm. These should have come out a while ago because I don't feel a lot of buzz for Zootopia. Despite the fact this is a good movie, I encourage you to see it. I enjoyed it, but I'm not feeling a lot of buzz on it. It's this type of stuff that they should have got on board with, like I said, two weeks ago. I'm going to buy it, but I'm going to disagree with you as far as when they released them because we're right in the... I mean, Oscars is here. It's on Sunday. This movie's coming out like right around the corner. I think that because... Good point. There's That's so, a good point. There's so yeah. much Oscar talk right now that when you see this and it's a way to also bring up... I mean, a lot of people might not even know all the movies too. It's and true, Maybe yeah. that's a way that... You, oh, actually, I heard about the Mr. Big Short. I thought that was the actual movie. You know? and <laughs> for me, my favorite is Cinderella. I love that big game <laughs> shoot. <laughs> Nowhere. It's great. So I love these posters. I think it's really clever. It, I haven't seen the movie, and I think it already gives me some of the tone for what I've seen in the trailer. So, yeah, it's big buy. I'm going to buy it as well. Yeah, it's a lighthearted take on what those, you know, people are putting out those honest posters, kind of like those honest yeah. trailers. And those are not as nice as these like no, I think they're I saw, funny though they are some of them are really funny I saw uh, the Bridge of Spies one this is I'm talking about the honest posters and it said dad porn 
<laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, this one, I, yeah, the Bridge of Sloth one is funny just because of that scene that we've already seen of the sloth in the in the movie, and then the the Mad Yaks Furry Road, Fury, yeah, <laughs> yeah, instead of Fury Road. Uh, yeah, I love them. Oh, I, you know what? I wish I I didn't bring it. I wish I had brought it, hon. The um, they Disney sent me an official driver's license, my Zootopia driver's license, oh, awesome. and it's like uh, John. Camel Pia or something like that <laughs> where he gives everybody like a, an animal last name. It was really cute. I should have brought it in to show you guys. All right, folks. Well, it is Friday, which means it's time for us to give our box office predictions brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Every week we run down and we pro, pro I was going to say procrastinate, <laughs> prognosticate. I, what am I thinking today? Prognosticate what we think the box office results are going to be come Monday. So, Dennis. You're up on the block first. What's going to be the top five of the box office come Monday? I have Deadpool repeating at number one. I know we have three three pretty big movies coming out, but I think Deadpool's still going to hold on to that. And then I have Eddie the Eagle. I think a lot of the buzz for that movie is going to spread. People want to see a feel-good movie, you know? Uh, and then I think Triple Nine, hopefully, since I'm such a John Hillco fan, he was here this past week. I'm hoping Triple Nine gets the third spot. I think Risen is doing much better than they expected. So I, I see some repeat business for that on the fourth slot. And the fifth, The Witch, I hope all that negativity that some people are having about the film doesn't affect it because I really enjoyed it. I know I'm not the horror fan. Oh, it's a so, damn good movie. So I it may be, maybe that crowd will come out and see it. All right, Christian, what about you? Top five. I got Deadpool again. Um, for number two, I actually have, I got Kung Fu Panda sticking around at two again. And then at three, I have Eddie the Eagle. Four, I have Triple Nine. And then five, Risen. Um, and the correct answer is number one, <laughs> Deadpool. Number two, Triple Nine. Number three, Eddie the Eagle. Number four, Risen. And number five, Gods of Egypt will sneak into that hey, top five. We'll sneak into oh, that top man. five spot. The Kung buzz. Fu Panda drops off. <laughs> the buzz on that God, it, Gods of Egypt is just... I so know into, it does. It sneaks into it number five and then right into the toilet. so yeah. bad. All right, folks. So those are our predictions. Make sure you check back on Monday and see how close any of us or how far all of us were from the actual results. And now it is that time of the show, guys, for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, if you're watching us live, we're going to save a little bit of time at the end of the show, take some of your live Twitter questions. So you can probably start tweeting those in any minute now. But for now, let's get to the mailbag questions. So, Natasha, what do we got? Juan writes, hello, guys and gals of Movie Talk. I really hope John gets to answer this question before he leaves Collider. You're in luck. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like how what you started all those years ago evolved into the type of show Movie Talk is now? Do you have a different vision for the show? And if so, can you explain what were the things that you tweaked along the way to make Movie Talk the way it is today? Maybe things you tried that did not work and things that you changed that worked for the better. Maybe even how the transition from AMC to Collider affected the content of the show. Good luck in your future projects. I hope you will still post things on your own YouTube channel. And congrats on doing a great job with Movie Talk and finishing your novel. <laughs> Thanks for Movie Talk and the other shows and for bringing in the schmoes to Collider. Can't wait to see the next phase. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it, it is funny. You know, Dennis and I, we reminisce every once in a while about remembering, and, and I had been doing it for a while, even before Dennis came on and joined me, about, you know, where we, we came from. And, you know, it started with me, with AMC, just using a spare bedroom to record some stuff, and that was it. And then as we started to grow and evolve, you know, Dennis and I, we set up shop in this converted storage closet at the AMC Burbank 16. It literally was a converted storage closet. Uh, so we started shooting things there. But honestly, what, what we have now here, this is kind of the fruition of what I thought movie talk should be. Like when I started, um, I actually started the world's first movie podcast. It was called the Movie Blog Audio Edition. And the whole idea at the time still is my philosophy today. When me and my buddies talked about movies, we sounded more like sports fans talking and blah, blah, blah. And when I would listen to people like on television or in print talk about movies, it was usually from more of an artistic point of view. It was more of a philosophical discussion than anything else. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. That's wonderful. But it wasn't speaking to me as an audience member. And so my philosophy was I want to bring a sports fan's enthusiasm and mindset 
into the world of movies, talking about movies as a film fan. And we did that, and for whatever reason, it clicked with our audience at the time when we were doing the podcast. We won the first like uh, podcast award that the bloggies did, and we were the first podcast of the year. We rolled on, we turned it into the video edition, um, and then you know it all just kept going. And when I joined up with AMC, I told them, you know, they were just wanted written articles, but I told them if I come on board, our goal is to do audio and video. That's what we're gonna do. And it took a couple of years to get there, but we got there. And then it became, once we got the show going, it became about fiddling with formats. Um, and then once I knew what the format was, the key, the only way it was going to work is to have the right people involved. And like I said, we got Dennis on really early. We had Amy Rose Eisenbach, for a, who was my right hand for a really long time, and she was incredible. And then eventually we brought on guys like Schnepp came on and the Schmoes. And it's just to the point now that it really is, in my opinion, firing on all cylinders. It really is working the way I want it to work. And that is kind of part of the reason why I feel so comfortable that now's as good a time as any for me to step away because I do feel like all the right pieces are in place. I feel like it's operating so smoothly right now. I feel like it's firing on all cylinders. Now's as good a time as any for me to go. As far as some of the things that we've tried before in the past, look, I have an absolute zero fear of failure. I don't mind trying new things out of fear that what if it doesn't work? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's always been my philosophy. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And so through the years, we've tried some things that we don't do anymore. You know, we remember a Versus. We did, uh, mm -hmm. we, back when we were at AMC, we had AMC Versus. We gave that a shot. We thought it was a good idea to try. We tried it, didn't work, we pulled the plug. And we reinvested it, but we learned things from every failure that we had. And then we continued to build. So it's a really, I can see it for the next three hours and, and answer that question, but in short, I love where the show is at right now. I've always envisioned it kind of being at this point and a little bit more. And uh, as guys, as people who are followers of the show and viewers of the show, you guys are really lucky because you have a great team that's in place here. It's gonna continue to do great. And uh, I look forward to watching it uh, in the future. Yeah, and you're still going to be on Heroes. I, I am and still going to be on Jedi Council. I am here. still going to be on Heroes. And he's participating in the first match of the Schmo now. I still don't know if it's the first one. I keep <laughs> telling you <laughs> that. I'm telling you, even, even if, even if we, we're going to tape these things, I'll make sure oh, that when, true, whenever yeah. it is, we're going to make sure yours is the first one that airs. And, right. you, and you'll still be coming to visit on Movie Talk as well. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, I purposefully picked this place as the Clyder... I'm not lying here. <laughs> I purposefully picked this place as our new studio for, for Collider, and at the time it was AMC, because it's within 10 minutes walking distance of my home. <laughs> uh, so yes, I'm gonna be very, very close. I'm gonna be able to stick my nose in from time to time. This is just the last movie talk you're gonna see me on. It'll be like you never left. It'll be like I never <laughs> left. Right, Nelson Valora writes, hello Collider crew, watching the latest movie threesome with ex-Collider John Campia. Ouch, that was plain, painful to write. I was wondering what is your opinion to some of the cultural differences in the movie going experience? Being a Portuguese person, I'll talk about the example I'm more familiar with. Portugal, like Campia said, we have pre-assigned tickets, and I recently found out that in the U.S. such a thing doesn't exist. And that really intrigues me because I can't even imagine a life without pre-assigned seatings. It would be mayhem. Besides that, the ratings in here are not nearly as extreme. Deadpool is 14 and over, for example. And the movie tickets are way cheaper. In Portugal, a movie ticket costs what is equal to $7, but most people, myself included, have a two for the price of one type of discount which ends up making my trip to the movie roughly three dollars and fifty cents all of that said is there any other cultural movie related subject that you guys know that exists someplace or else and you wish existed in the u.s or something you would change in the movie going experience thanks and the best of regards from portugal ah Port i a group with a lot of people from portugal man um Look, you said a lot of things in the email, <laughs> going over a lot of different topics. But yeah, I was on uh, Fandango's movie threesome with uh, Christian Harloff and Tiffany Smith the other day. And, and I ranted on something I've ranted about a few times here. Let me get this last shot in while I can. <laughs> Every civilized country in the world, all right? No, I'm not talking about the great Canadian free healthcare system that everybody else <laughs> in the world gets, but stupid, you know, this country that can't seem to wrap their heads around. Anyway, um, look. Every civilized country in the world, pretty much, has pre-assigned seating. When I talk about pre-assigned seating at the theaters, I get tons of emails and messages from people all over the world going, wait a minute, you backwards Neanderthals don't have pre-assigned seating? Nope, not in Canada, not in the US. Now, only in Canada and the US are we 
starting to see it. The last couple of years, like the AMC Prime now yeah. is pre-signed seating, but every other theater in that AMC Burbank 16 is still in the Stone Ages, where you gotta rush in like a herd of cattle and hopefully you'll get a good seat. Every civilized country, everything we do in a society that you get a ticket for pretty much, gives you your seat. You go to the opera and you buy your ticket, it has your seat number on it. Unless you're flying Southwest, every <laughs> airline you get on, you get your ticket, it tells you what seat you're sitting in. You go into an NFL football game, you get your ticket, it tells you what seat you're sitting in. Everything else except what should be the easiest industry in the movie for in the, in the world to do this in, the movies. It is the simplest concept. Look, there was a charm, I guess, some nostalgic charm to the idea of, I'm going to go down and get in line for seven hours to make sure I get a good seat. You know what? I'm not 16 anymore. So you can have your three-hour ass on the concrete kind of sitting around and for five hours kind of day. That's great for you. Hoo-ha. Me, I want to be able to buy my ticket and know if my showtime is at 7 o'clock, even if it's opening night, I can walk in at 7 o'clock. It's, it's just, it's a no-brainer. And now every time I hear somebody raise an objection, I have yet to hear one legitimate objection to the pre-assigned seating model. Every objection anybody's ever brought up to me with pre-assigned seating are problems that would equally apply to non-pre-assigned seating. Here's the one everybody gets. Here's the one, all right? This is the one that everybody falls back to. But John, what if I get my pre-assigned seat and I show up to the movie theater and somebody's puked on my seat or some other <laughs> yeah, variation, yeah. Yeah. or there's a big wad of bubble gum on my seat. To which I reply, then change your seat. But what if the theater is full? If the theater is full, then it would be full with non pre assigned seating and you'd still be out of luck. That's the basic thing. Every objection somebody brings up for the pre assigned seating thing has an equal thing to being non pre assigned. It, it, it doesn't matter. There is no downside to pre assigned seating. Get with pre-assigned seating, get with the rest of the civilized world, get with every other industry that sells tickets in this country. Please, movie theater industry, and I'm talking specifically to you, MC, because I got a good relationship with you. Every single theater should be pre-assigned seating. Anyway, that's my rant. Yeah, and AMC is, I think they're starting to transition towards that because the Century They do seem to be, The yes. Century City one is all pre-assigned yeah. seating. The one at Burbank here is only the AMC Prime. And I think it's starting to, I think within 10 years, the U.S., it's going to be all pre-assigned seating as they upgrade. I hope it's five. I mean, because well, I, I, I know, I know. It's it L.A. and New York is starting to come around, but there's other parts of the country that don't have it at, at all. Um, there's one, there's a couple theaters um, in Amsterdam that for comedies alone, they give out hash brownies. That'd be nice. To, to <laughs> around, so, yeah. and, then, and speaking of what he's talking about culturally uh i remember when i went to taiwan we saw a movie they had the national anthem at the beginning like you had a canada stand, used to do that you had to stand up during the national anthem and then i don't know if this is all theaters in taiwan but this particular one had like the bathroom was in the back i'm not talking about you go outside in the back i'm talking about like it was it, like, in the back of the theater? Well, I mean, it was still sectioned off, like it's in your a, seat. whatever. You, but you, no, <laughs> it's you could seat. hear though. You could hear, like yeah. it was that close. Oh, yeah. You could hear it. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, the snacks. I'm sure in every country are different. Not everyone is like we think of popcorn. Like, oh, that's the movie treat. But in other countries, it's different stuff. Right. And, and then our friend Chuck, um, I forgot which country it was, but he said when he traveled to Central America. He said one country, when they went to go watch the movie, they stopped the movie halfway through the showing to sell snacks. And then they wouldn't turn the movie back on until they sold enough oh. snacks. Oh, yeah, that you told me about yeah. that. That's I right. I think that's pretty pretty hilarious. That's oh, <laughs> yeah. pretty oh awful. My God. Uh, that was the last mailbag question, yeah. right? It All right, was. folks, I said we'd save a few minutes at the end of the show, take some of your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Get your tweets into us. Tweet us at Collider Video. It's just that simple. Natasha, what have you picked out today? Christian asks, for John, what will be the best and worst thing about not doing movie talk anymore? The best thing is not waking up at 5 in the morning. That's going to be the best thing. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> That's going to be awesome. Um, the worst thing... Um, is going to be, uh, look, a, a lot of people say this and it's pure bullshit. I'm going to say it and it's totally true. I look forward to coming into this studio every day because of the people that are going to be here when I arrive. Uh, well, that's not necessarily true because when I arrive, no one else is here. But <laughs> that, that will be there eventually. That will be there by 11 o'clock. Um, I work 
it, with such a great group of people, but together we've also fostered a really fun environment. I mean, that's always been really, like right back for when Dennis and I were in a, a storage closet, mm -hmm. we always said amongst ourselves, we want this to be a place that we enjoy coming to, that we have fun with each other. Whenever we would cast new people or hire new people on, their talent was never the number one question. The number one question we always asked ourselves was, what's the chemistry gonna be like with the team? And that, that was the number one question. Then we got into issues of talent because if somebody wasn't a good fit with the team and it caused disruption or whatever, we didn't want that to be in here. We didn't want that to be a part of it. Um, and so I can honestly say probably the thing I will miss the absolute most is just the, the camaraderie and being able to come in here every day and not just get together with your friends, but get together to talk movies uh, with your friends. And that's, uh, that's been a joy and a privilege that I've enjoyed for the last number of years. So that is what I will miss the most. All right, and keeping on memory lane with Mr. Woolums asks, what was your fondest memory of being on Collider? Uh, being on Collider. Well, if we're gonna just say movie talk in general, I have to go back before the Collider days. I still think my favorite, a couple of my favorite things that we've ever done for different reasons. One, the honorable mention would be our 24 hour uh, marathon that we did for the that Philippine disaster. That was fun. We got sick as hell yes. as a result of that. <laughs> we did 24 hours straight and then got in a car and drove to Vegas. Yes. Not, <laughs> the smart, not the smartest thing to do. Not the smartest thing to do, but because of the, you guys, our goal was like $5,000 raised. You guys helped us raise $25,000 for the hurricane relief in the Philippines, which is awesome. But I gotta say probably the biggest kick I've got out of all the stuff that we've done, besides the award ceremonies and the trophies we've won and things like that, was probably our Guardians of the Galaxy night. Our Guardians of the Galaxy night, we had James Gunn, the High Lord Kevin Feige, and Chris Pratt uh, came into studio with us and hung out for an hour, and we did this whole special just on Guardians of the Galaxy, and that was a hoot. That was a lot of fun. The 100 million view party was yeah, pretty awesome. The 100 crazy. million view party was awesome. Yeah. Actually, now that you mention it, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I got to meet a lot of you guys for the first time. I think I met my assistant for the first yes. time at her 100 million view party. Wendy um, and her husband were there, so that was a lot of fun, too. What are some of your favorite memories we've had here? Yeah, I think while? mine is the 24-hour marathon, especially that point where you, me, and Jeanette were pretty delicious. Delirious. It was it was <laughs> yes, towards we like were. the end of our time and we were just We started I, talking about the Phantom Menace. Yeah, for like an, that, hour, for an hour. For an hour. because uh, you know, when you're trying to fill up time, you just talk and talk and talk. So one subject could last like an hour yeah. long. And we were delirious, so we're just going off and off and off. And that probably is my favorite memory. When Schnepp gets tired, it's like he's getting drunk. <laughs> Seriously, like when when he, when Shep is getting tired, you'd think he was getting drunk because he just starts getting a little bit more delirious. I mean, the hundred million view for for me, uh, for sure, because that was it was our first year, Mark and I on at yeah. part of the crew and seeing because the, you know to go back as far as the first time I had ever heard of AMC or Movie Talk or, or John was that I remember being on Schmoes one night and people were tweeting in like you need to go you need to speak to you, with John Campy on Movie Talk on Movie Talk we're like well. Who's John Campion? Who's John Campion? And we, we started tuning in, and we, we had very similar views on on movies. And then, and then he invited us on, and we were able to kind of do that and to see that other people and what you said before in regards to what you were looking to do, talking to people that saw movies the way that talked to you the way that you mm. saw movies, and if you felt like people were talking to you as a fan, that was kind of always Mark, and on, uh, that was our philosophy and what we wanted to do. And that's, I think that's why we vibed so well with yeah. you when you were here. But I. I have to say, I mean, the two things that kind of is pitching you the the Star Wars show, and you going, yeah, and yeah, then that's gonna work. And then we did that, and then being able to t go from that and taking that into being able to go to the Force Awakens premiere all together. That was How much amazing. fun was that? Yeah. That that was. I still remember we were doing Movie Talker Jedi Council. We were doing Movie Talker Jedi Council live. It was one of the two, and it was you, me, and Mark. And no, M Mark was in in the other room. That's right. It was right. Movie Talk. It was Movie yeah. Talk. And my, a buzz went off on my phone, and I very rarely have my phone with me on set, but that day I did. And so when the camera was on somebody else, I just peeked down, and I got the email from Disney inviting me to the <laughs> thing. And I'm just like, <sighs> and I, I, I can't tell you guys the email I just got, but I'll tell you soon. I was like freaking out on camera. And then Mark went back, or Christian went back afterwards, and uh, him and Mark got the invites as well. And it was, it was so cool, like you, me, Mark, and Tiffany, and Anne came along as well. But the four of us from Jedi Council being able to be there yeah. and then having celebrities and people involved in the Star Wars universe coming up to us talking about how big of fans they are of Jedi Council. That, that was absolutely surreal. We've had a, the opportunity to do some really 
cool, wonderful, weird, and amazing things. So, yeah. All right. What's next? A lot of questions on this one. Geeky Nomnivore asks, congrats on the pride, John. <laughs> Thank you. Who would you like to make slash be in the film should it be made into one? Um, yeah, I've had a lot of people ask me about who would you like to direct the movie. Uh, number one, let's find out if you guys read it and think it's a bag of shit or not. <laughs> so let's get that out of the way first. Should you uh, adjudicate that it is not a bag of shit, um, I would, well, my favorite director of all time is Steven Spielberg, but honestly, I think the two buddies of mine, Mark Neveldine and Brian Taylor, would do an awesome job on this, on this story. I think they'd be great. And I don't know about who play, it, there's several lead characters, but Petros is the one that kind of, the, the, he's the kid on the cover of the book. I could see, give him six months to work out a lot, I could see Logan Lerman playing it. Hmm. Who's also kind of my pick to play Han Solo, by the way, but um, yeah, I could see Logan Lerman. All right, this question's for Christian. Josh Saylor asks, what up for Christian? Who are you most excited to see at the Oscars red carpet? Oh, man. So, yeah, for people who don't know, I'm, I'm able to cover the red carpet for Fandango. There's a bunch of videos on Very my Facebook cool. that, that we shot. So if you want to see kind of the lead up to that, it's I had to try to lose weight. Didn't lose a pound. Um, <laughs> not, not one pound. I think I gained three. Um, but I, I don't know. You know, it's going to be a little bit more of a fun vibe. I'm not going to be doing the standard like, what are you wearing? And it's, it's going to be pretty silly, I think, too, what we're kind of going for. I he's not even I mean he is nominated I think it's Brian Cranston somebody I really wanna I, I want to talk to he's for a sure. blast yeah I want to talk to Brian Cranston all right and this one's for Dennis T J Miller asked to pass the torch when will Dennis put bags of ice down his pants like Campia did during <laughs> the ice bucket phase it is a right of passage for leadership here Dennis you uh, you're, you'll pretty we much actually have, have a bag this. of ice right now do it no, yeah. I'm just yeah. Yeah. I think I'll pass on that oh. for those of you who don't know what he's talking about remember when the big ice bucket challenge was going on so anyway I had a whole ton of people online t challenging me the ice bucket challenge so I thought well I'm not I don't want to do what everybody else does so we did a little bit of a different take so what we did is we got on set of movie talk and we got out a big bag of ice, and while doing movie talk, I poured the bag of ice down the front of my pants. <laughs> and I stayed on the show and kept doing the show. I was able to hold out for 10 minutes. Oh, and say, then not the whole time. No, and after about 10 minutes, the nether region started getting really numb, and I had to run yeah. out of the uh, Did studio. Did you do at the for beginning of the show, or at least? Uh, I think it was about five or ten minutes it, into the show. Oh, okay. I think. Wasn't yeah, it, it was quick because that was like my audition to see if I could host or not for the show. Because oh, he, that's right, I, I, I said, Christian, take over. Take over, <laughs> and then yeah, I was sitting there and you see him going. <laughs> 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 after about five, like at first, I'm like, oh, whatever. After about five minutes, I'm like banging the yeah, table. Yeah, like, yeah. So was, my opinion on this. He really wasn't concentrating on any yeah. of the topics. <laughs> no, what I'll say is, you guys raised a lot of money you guys donated yeah, a lot of money to the cause that day so so thank you very much and i would pay to come back and see dennis do this <laughs> i would like that very much all right what's next okay sport camera action ask in honor of gods of egypt what is the worst <laughs> movie that had a huge budget oh well, there, point look, break remake I I had a huge budget uh battlefield earth had a very large budget mm -hmm. Uh, recently, Jupiter Ascending was a giant pile of trash. Yeah. Wasn't Fan Fantastic Four had a huge budget yeah. as well? Oh. Uh -huh. Not as huge as, as you'd think, yeah, though. Okay. That's true. But the Point Break thing, the reason a lot of people don't know is because it's kind of been like hidden yeah. behind the scenes. Everyone's like, oh, it was, didn't cost that much. It didn't cost almost $200 million to make. <laughs> I know. Oh. I, I, I remember oh. I was with you when we heard that number. I'm yeah. like, are you are you kidding me? Was it, that serious? Like. Wow, somebody really crapped the bed on that one. Yeah, All right, let's take two it. more. <laughs> okay. Um, Garen Howells asks, favorite movie collectible slash piece, piece of merchandise you've ever owned? Chewbacca mug, Christian? That's nah, <laughs> a good one. It's a good one. Uh, man, I got to think about it. I, I can tell you, well, the one I, the one I have is I have a rug out on and yes everybody here i am taking my rug uh, i have a rug out in the main uh, lobby of the uh, of the studio here it's it's uh han solo frozen and carbonite uh, i love that thing the one i almost had i almost had because i really did consider a life of crime for a moment um i was at skywalker ranch and they brought me into this one building and a lot of things just like giant cottages at skywalker ranch and they put me in the very first thing in the lobby of this stuff was the idol from raiders of the lost ark in a glass case and I'm just sitting at it and I'm looking around and the dude left me for a second to go use the bath and I'm like, <laughs> would they notice? If you smash the glass would case, they notice? put it down your pants <laughs> and walk yeah, off. Nice challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't do it though, but man, that would have been pretty sweet. But yeah, I'd say the rug. Uh, I don't know. I, I like 
posters and t-shirts i just ordered a mondo poster for john hill coats the proposition so i'm gonna oh, nice. i'm gonna put, put that up here somewhere so i have a cool batman figurine from like the the christopher oh, Nolan. the one you got in your office yeah. that is a cool yeah, one. Like, this is really it's, cool it's him just kind of him on the descent and i got that when i was at warner brothers and it's pretty cool all right last question of the day all right last question and i'm dying to know this answer uh, too oh wow flex asks Hey, will we ever get a John Campia breakdance video? <laughs> it's your birthday, so you gotta do like a birthday dance, John. Um, it's your intro for the Shmona. Yeah. Oh, sh <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I used to be that guy uh, who walked around in an Adidas windbreaker outfit, uh, blue, by the way. It was blue. Uh, and me and my buddies would always have a good supply of cardboard boxes on, on hand to break down. And whether it was at the foot of Jackson Square, for those of you from Hamilton, the Toronto area, Jackson Square, we'd break, down, break dance out there. Uh, we, um, yeah, I, and I actually wrote on my grade eight report that my long-term goal and dream was to be a professional break dancer. A dream I was able to fulfill when I was in grade nine. I was actually a professional break dancer for a little while. Uh, and then it was, I remember I had to be 15 and I was laying in bed at night, and I don't know if it was just a, that a moment of zen, or if it was actually the voice of God speaking to me, but I heard like in the vo middle of the night, I heard this voice say, John, you look stupid. <laughs> that was me. Stop it. <laughs> it was saying, it was saying. <laughs> Stop it. Uh -huh. um, and so, and I, I'm, you're never gonna find a picture of this, but I used to shave the sides of my head, and just leave a little bit of hair, and then with a razor, cut out little lightning bolts. Oh my God. And and how wait much? For it. How much? Wait for it. And wait got for it. Somewhere. And then what little hair was there that the lightning bolts cut out? Bleached the hair blonde. Oh, man. <laughs> How much, Ann? So good. I'm telling you. Wow. So good. Send it. Uh, our breakdancing crew was called the uh, was called the Zodiac Crew, and I was Pisces. Look at that. And you will never. What's your sign? Ever <laughs> find. Uh, this is in an era before What's we all carried sign? around little video recording devices in our pockets. Oh, man. You will never find a picture, because I've destroyed what little there were. Uh, or any video of and, it. Until ever. I invent time travel. <laughs> We're going to find it. You, you don't want to call yourself Zap, Zap the Breakdancer. Zap, no, no, uh, that was, no, that was my D&D <laughs> <D &D> character. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> all right. That was all the ladies in the world right now saying, what did I miss out on? Um, all right, guys, that'll do it for us. Thank you so much for joining us for this installment of uh, Collider Movie Talk. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing out our friends over at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie movie ticket information. Make sure you bookmark Collider.com, the website keeping up to date on everything going on in the world of entertainment. And while you're here, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. I want to thank, first of all, sitting on my left, the new head of Collider Video, Mr. Dennis Zen. Dennis, where can people find you online? Well, I want to say again, all our thanks and appreciation for John, for all the support and all all the stuff that you've built for us to, to continue on and and you know we're still gonna see you a lot you know you're not gonna be like tomorrow morning 9 45 we're watching a ufc yes. in the and morning the oscars. <laughs> and also and uh, oscars we're, we're on doing Sunday? our oscar show on sunday at 4 p.m which john also will be part of as as well um you can find me on twitter at think hero on instagram dennis.tzng Sitting over here on my right, probably my one big mistake managing this place, <laughs> Mr. Christian Harloff. Oh, Christian, where can people find you online? Um, <laughs> no. uh, you can find me at Christian Harloff, but you can also find this character. You're going to see him every Thursday on Collider Jedi Council. You can find the latest episode that we did yesterday. It's up there right now. And also check out, John, we just did uh, Movie Threesome on Fandango's Movie Clips Originals. But I'm also going to be doing a lot. Uh, I'm kind of going away from the Periscope, and I'm going to start going towards Facebook Live. So if you aren't following me on on my page, Christian Harloff, do that because I'm gonna be doing a lot of Q and A's there. I'll be doing stuff from here as well too. So go ahead and follow me over there. It's like you just traded in cocaine for crack. Yeah, <laughs> like, like you're yeah. constantly on this stuff. And, and of course, sitting on the very end, our lovely host today, Miss Natasha Martinez. Natasha, where can people find you? Well, first of all, again, thank you, John, for just creating this opportunity for all of us, and your legacy will live on in this studio. Um, you guys can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Natasha Alexis underscore. Uh, and of course, uh, you can go to Amazon right now, uh, Star Wars The Plug Awakens. You can find my book, The Pride, on Amazon right now. Thank you guys again. Because of you, we cracked the top 100 on Amazon in its first couple of days. Thank you so much for that. You can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. I want to thank, uh, hey, Ann, why don't you come over here for a second here? Since you're here, my wife is here. I'm going to drop this for sure. Yeah, I'm you didn't see it at the beginning of the show. Sit next to each other. This is the birthday cake yeah, Ann brought in for me, this BB-8 birthday cake. Um, I want to thank... 
you guys, first of all, uh, who watch us, thank you so much for being a part of this. You know, I still remember when we threw a little party. Uh, Justin came down, our AMC guy came down. The first show that we did that hit 5,000 viewers. <laughs> And I remember we had this little party, we went out, we had dinner. I remember when we hit 10,000 subscribers, another party, another night, another dinner, and all that kind of stuff. And you know, every quarter in the past five years, because of you and your support, our viewers have, our subscribers and our views have gone up every single quarter without fail, uh, sometimes uh, exponentially. Uh, you guys have been, uh, there with us, you've been fans with us, you've made it be a lot of fun for us to do this because of your interactions with us, whether it's on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or here in the comments section or whatever it is. Uh, and we owe everything that we've been able to do here. All these great memories we're talking about, the 100 million view party, uh, you know, Lucasfilm inviting us to the Star Wars premiere, having Chris Pratt come down, all that stuff was because you guys supported us and encouraged us. So I wanna thank you. And I uh, really have to thank um, the lady sitting beside me on my right, uh, and Campia, uh, who believe me when I tell you guys, this studio would not be here, this show would not be here, none of this would have been possible had I not had the support uh, of Ann Campia, who has allowed me to take some really crazy risks, to do some really stupid things that I think a lot of significant others would not allow you to do. But she has not just been okay with me doing it. She has supported me and encouraged me and been our, all of us, our biggest cheerleader. Uh, and none of this would have been possible without Anne being here. So thank you, baby. I love you. I love you. And, um, and to uh, my several mistresses around the world seeing that. <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, again, guys, this has been the greatest thing in the world. And what I said earlier, let me reiterate. One of the reasons I feel comfortable leaving now is because it is true. This operation has never been in better shape. There's never been better leadership and position. We've never had all the right pieces in place the way we do right now. Firing on all cylinders, this thing is in good hands and is gonna be great moving ahead. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys on Jedi Council uh, and on Heroes and on the things I have coming up as well. So again, thank you for all that. So to all the guys behind the scenes, uh, Jonathan and Adam and, and just all everybody who's been a part of this, to Wendy, uh, to Mark and Christian and Schnepp and everybody else who's a part of this, Ashley and Sinead and uh, all the other names I'm forgetting to say right now. Ray. Oh, of course, Ray. <laughs> well, yeah, Ray. Um, to Ray, uh, thank you guys for everything. And this show will be back uh, bigger and better than ever on Monday. Make sure you come back and join us. So thank you again. And for Collider Video, until next time, for one last time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.